uh, in the first uh, kind of division it will go under the gallian principle next promotion of cottage industries article 43 <music> Good morning, students. Welcome back to Plutus IS. So we are we are in the 95 days prelims challenge. So today is our fifth day. Uh, the topic for today's discussion is DPSP, Direct to Principles of State Policy. So this is also very important from the point of view of uh, prelims examination. There are number of questions have been asked over the years from this topic also. So without wasting much time, we will go and discuss the topic first we will understand the genesis of dpsp i mean from where the idea of directive principles of state policy has come so first the history of dpsp can be traced back to karachi resolution of 1931 so this is a very important and historic uh, session of congress many rights have been adopted radical change has come in the ideology of congress indian national congress you will know much about much more about this session in the history classes so uh, for here for this class remember that the genesis of dpsp can be traced back to karachi uh, karachi session and karachi, karachi resolution of 1931 so from the 1920s onwards uh, the socialist ideas have started influencing Indian minds also. So that was the trend all over India, uh, sorry, all over the world. Uh, the socialist uh, trends were there and uh, India was not an exception to it. So many socialists have emerged in, emerged in India. So basically, the it, DPSP contained the socialist ideals also. Right. So similarly, when uh, the discussions in the constituent assembly were going on uh, there were suggestions of justiciable and non non justiciable rights so some committees were uh, discussing and suggested some committees suggested justiciable and non justiciable categories of rights so unit 4 four of the subpro uh, committee also just suggested it and uh, the rights subcommittee so as you all know, there were some subcommittees working when the constitution is being drafted. So the rights subcommittee, it is also suggested uh, the justiciable and the non-justiciable -justici rights. So basically, the DPSP, Directive Principles of State Policy, come under non-justiciable category. Right. So the primary source, if you see the primary source, the uh, principles of uh, the directive principles have borrowed from the Irish constitution. So we can say this is the primary source. So the directive principles of state policy have been taken from the Irish constitution. So, Granville asked him, uh, he is a constitutional expert. According to his opinion, the directive principles attracted the attention of wide range of constituent assembly members. So, the founding fathers wanted that a particular uh, part for directive principles shall be there. Right. So actually, the directive principles of state policy also have the vision and ideals of the founding fathers. Right. So inclusion of these provisions emphasizes the state's role in the social and economic development of society. So actually, we have seen fundamental rights. They are for political justice. So earlier in earlier classes uh, we have seen in preamble basically the constitution uh, strives to provide social economic and political justice political justice part this is covered in part 3 of the constitution that is fundamental rights now the social and economic justice that is guaranteed through part 4 dpsp 
part four of the constitution direct to principles of state policy so uh, also remember that the dpsp directive principles of state policy resemble the hindu outlook some principles are uh, there in the dpsp uh, the source of those principles can be traced to hinduism for example protection of cattle protection of cattle and draught animals so this uh, particular principles can be traced to uh, hindu ideology and a certain gandhian ideas also there uh, for example uh, promotion of cottage industries right and the other one is organization of village panchayats organization of village panchayats so these kind of ideas so they reflect the gandhian ideology right the constitution uh, constituent assembly tried to incorporate uh, i mean try to i mean it decided to incorporate uh, the directive principles in the part 4 of the constitution so part 3 these are fundamental rights so this ensure these rights fundamental rights ensure political justice and part 4 dpsp these ensure social and economic justice right so now we will see we will do a brief survey of directive principles of state policy we will see all the provisions that are there in the directive principles and we will see what each article says right so the dpsp directive principles start with article 36 so here the definition of state is given so basically we will see uh, in the directive principles the state has given the responsibility to achieve these ideals the goals that are given in the directive principles so article 36 defines what state means so the state uh, the state the particular word state has a diverse uh, meaning it includes uh, central government state governments judiciary parliament state legislatures and all other organizations working under the government of india including it also the list also includes local local bodies the bodies that are i mean the governing bodies that are there at the local local level so the state the word state has a lot i mean big def, uh, big list or big definition it in, comprises of lot of uh, entities or organization so try to remember this definition it may come as a question in the prelims examination so basically article 36 defines the state right uh, article 37 application of principles contained in this part so article 37 clarifies that the principles of uh, in the directive uh, principles of state policy are not enforceable but fundamental so these uh, dpsp directive principles are non justiciable they are not enforceable by courts of law we will uh, later in this lecture understand what is exactly meant by non enforceable nature of uh, directive principles of state policy but another word uh, is there here fundamental so these uh, directive principles are fundamental in governance of the country so basically for the governance and of the country the government of the day make makes several acts it brings in several policies so in doing all these things they the dpsp directive principles become fundamental right article 38 the article says state to secure social order for promotion of promotion and welfare of the people so article 38 emphasizes that the state shall strive for a social order 
promoting welfare of the people so basically article 38 is saying the state uh, state should strive for welfare of the people right article 39 says principle particular principles of policy that has to be followed by state state means yeah government so basically the word state has a wide meaning uh, here the governments all the governments that are existing at the three levels they should follow certain principles so here the principles such as social and economic justice we have seen this phrase earlier also and also the principle of minimizing inequalities so the state should try to minimize the inequalities and it ensure opportunities to all sections of the people it should ensure the opportunities to all sections of the people right article 39a this was not there in the original constitution it was added through 42nd amendment of 1976 so majorly uh, most of the amendments that are uh, done for the dpsp that are there in the directive principles are brought through brought, brought through this 42nd constitutional amendment act only only uh, two amendments are there that were uh, brought through the different uh, different amendments we will see uh, the, uh, those amendments also so basically most of the amendments came through this constitutional amendment act uh, 42nd constitutional amendment act so here the state should uh, provide people free legal aid right to ensure equal justice so the state should ensure to all people equal justice so for that purpose free legal aid free legal aid has been incorporated in the directive principles of state policy 40 organization of village panchayats so basically as we have discussed earlier this is a gandhian principle so the state should, uh, should strive to organize village panchayats so this is to promote decentralized uh, self government at the grassroots level right so the state should strive for promoting decentralized self government at the grassroots level uh, next article 41 very very important article you can quote this article in your mains answers also while writing the answers so basically the article says right to work education and to public assistance in particular cases so article 41 emphasizes emphasizes the right to work right to work right to education and public assistance for those unable to secure a right uh, livelihood for example the sections like differently abled differently abled old aged people so these people will not be in a position to secure a decent livelihood livelihood so for those people the state should provide assistance uh, assistance so for this purpose we have national social assistance program we, we will see in the later part uh, how the state has implemented these DP, uh, dpsp what are the acts and what are the programs that have been brought by the uh, governments to implement dpsp one such program one such scheme is to provide uh, monthly support to these uh, old age people and uh, differently abled people also for work we have banrega right which is ensuring right to work and education we have right to education act of 2009 so basically the government has tried to implement certain uh, directive principles uh, principles of state policy these are few examples so article 41 is very very important article 42 which uh, the article says that the state should strive to provide just and humane conditions of work and maternity relief so basically the provision is talking rights at the workplace right the article is talking about rights at the workplace right article 43 this is also very important 
it is uh, saying that the state should strive for providing living wages for workers so whatever the wage a person is getting a worker is getting it is it should be adequate so the wage uh, the wage whatever the person is getting it should be adequate for to ensure this one we have brought in the minimum wages act so the government is uh, i mean uh, there are minimum wages rules and uh, minimum wage has been guaranteed so this particular act has been brought to ensure the uh, to implement this particular directive principle right article 43a uh, it says that the state should strive for participation of workers in the management of industries so basically this is also brought through 42nd amendment act so uh, this is also in a certain way to minimize the economic inequalities and uh, making opportunities to all people and uh, making the workers in the uh, as part and parcel of the management so to fulfill all these uh, principles or conditions this particular the state should strive for work for the workers in the management of industries this is also ensures that the resources resources are not concentrated in the uh, in the hands of the in the few hands hands of the few people so basically this is to prevent the concentration of wealth right so this particular uh, principle ensures that wealth is not concentrated in only few hands right next article 43 b promotion of cooperative societies as we all know cooperative uh, the feature of cooperative uh, cooperative societies are the spirit of cooperation it failed to take roots in india there are only few exceptions like amul so the government once again retried to kindle the spirit of uh, cooperation to basically develop the rural india the grassroots people so this particular uh, uh, article has been inserted through uh, 92nd 97th constitutional amendment act in 2011 so article uh, 43 directs the state to promote cooperative societies for social and economic cooperation especially in the rural india we also see there is an amendment to the article 19 also so a provision relating to cooperative societies is incorporated there also and uh, joining a cooperative has been made as a fundamental right through that amendment so try to remember this aspect also it may also come in the examination next one is very important and very contentious it will uh, be frequently in the news so uniform civil code so the state should the directive principles say that the state should strive for strive to bring in a uniform civil code in the uh, ensuring for in, by uh, for ensuring uniform personal laws so personal laws are now different for different religions so each religion has a separate personal law so what article 44 says that the state should strive for a uniform uh, civil code so the recent example is uttarakhand government government has brought in a uniform civil code for the state so it is interesting that a state government uh, is bringing the uniform civil code uh, so it is a recent development we will wait and see what how the supreme court will respond to this particular uh, uh, uniform civil code or act we will wait and see the next article is article 45 promotion of early childhood care and education to children below age of 14 years so the state should ensure that uh, child, children are well taken care of and they are well educated the important another important article is article 46 promotion of educational and economic interests of 
scheduled class, scheduled tribes, and other weaker sections. So we can say this is the source for reservations for SCs, SPs, and OBCs in uh, educational institutions, in jobs, and also in legislatures. Next, Article 47, duty of the state to raise the level of nutrition and the standard of living to improve public health. Right. Next, 48, this is also very important, organization of agriculture and animal, animal husbandry. So, the state should also strive for organizing agriculture on modern lines and improve the sector of animal husbandry because this particular uh, provision has been incorporated because almost 70 percent of the people are living in rural areas and uh, more than 55 percent of Indian population are still dependent on agriculture. So, to take care of the vast majority of the society, this particular dis uh, directive principle has been incorporated in the constitution. Next is uh, 48A. This is also incorporated through 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act. This says that protection and improvement of environment, environment and safeguard forest and wildlife right. So, the duty, it says that it uh, depicts the duty uh, of the state to protect environment, forest and wildlife for ecological balance. Next, 49. Promotion of uh, protection of monuments and the places and objects of national importance. So basically, this uh, <coughs> provision has been incorporated to incorporated to protect our rich cultural cultural heritage and monuments. So. Uh, to implement, to achieve this goal, we also have, the government also brought in a act to protect the ancient and historic monuments. Right. Uh, next provision is separation of judiciary from executive. So, this is a political and intellectual ideal. So, basically, to ensure uh, judicial independence and justice is properly uh, given to the people, uh, the constitution advocated for separation of judiciary from executive. This is also pre, uh, princ uh, this is also the principle of separation of powers. All right. So this will the separation of powers will ensure uh, proper checks and balances and uh, no organ of the government. Basically, there are three organs of the government. Those are executive. Judiciary and legislature. So, to ensure proper administration of the country or proper uh, proper uh, administration of the country, we should uh, there should be proper division, uh, uh, separation of powers between uh, among these three organs, and there should be proper checks and balances. So, to ensure that principle, this article has been incorporated in the directive principles of state policy. Next, the last article in DPSP is promotion of international peace and security. So, this is also very, very important. Uh, the article asks the government to ensure peaceful existence with the neighbors and other countries. So, it also says that fostering good relations with other neighbors. It also says that the disputes, if any disputes are there, they, sh they shall be settled peaceful manner, in peaceful manner, right. So, this is the broad and brief survey of the, all the directive principles that are mentioned in part 4. Next, uh, the constitutional experts uh, <coughs> uh, try to classify or categorize classify or categorize directive, directive principles of state policy. Some uh, one categorization, uh, categorization is there are some Gandhian principles or Gandhian ideal, uh, ideas, Gandhian principles. There are some social, socialist or social principles and uh, there are some 
liberal intellectual ideals. Ideals. It basically this classification is given by M. P. Sharma. Here, I am taking the classification that is given in eleventh N. C. R. T. So basically, the uh, D. P. S. P. Here have been uh, divided into three categories. First is goals. So the D. P. S. P. Some of the provisions that are mentioned, the D. P. S. P. Are goals that has to be. in the uh, i uh, achieved by india as a collective society next there are certain rights that are given to individual and individual individuals should enjoy those rights for example right to work so these kind of rights should be there uh, for the individuals next one is certain policies that are gov uh, that the government should adopt so basically we can see three types of uh, directive principles that are uh incorporated in the constitution now we will see the goals so the goals are like welfare of the people that is there in the article 38 social economic and political justice that is guaranteed to people that is there in the article 38 and 39 next rising the uh, rising the standards of living of the people that is there in the that is incorporated in article 39a and equitable distribution of resources so that is ensured through article 39b next promotion of international peace so we have seen article 51 mentions it so these are some goals that that are incorporated in the directive principles now we will see non justiciable rights rights uh, these are rights guaranteed through constitution but they are non justiciable right adequate livelihood that is mentioned in article 39a equal pay for equal work for men and women so earlier there were unequal wages for the same work done by women and men so the particular uh, dpsp uh, tries to negate that and ensure that equal wages are paid to both men and women for the same work done so basically this is mentioned in article 39d next right against economic exploitation this is ensured through article 39c next right to work this is uh, incorporated in article 41 next early child, uh, childhood care and education so this is mentioned in article 45 next we will see some policies that the government should strive to achieve in the course of the administration first one is uniform civil code that is mentioned in article 44 uh, <coughs> there is a lot of debate going on Uh, about this article and provision so we will see what happens keep track of the all the developments that are hap happening uh, regarding this article particular uh, item uniform civil code remember the example of uttarakhand right next one is prohibition of consumption of alcoholic liquor this is mentioned in article 47 so basically this is the principle regarding health the promotion of health so we can say this is also a gandhian principle right so if we classify <coughs> uh in the first uh, kind of division it will go under the gandhian principle next promotion of cottage cottage industries article 43 so this is also the ideology of uh, mahatma gandhi ji it will come under the principles of gandhian ideology next one is prevention of slaughter of useful cattle article 48 promotion of village panchayats article 40 so basically these are the policies uh, which the state should strive to achieve right next we will see the amendments to directive principles of state policy so there are some important amendments as i have said earlier there are mostly amendments have come through 42nd amendment act it is made in 1976 during the uh, prime ministership of mrs indira gandhi so first amendment is 42nd uh, amendment act so the amendments made made are ensure healthy development of children and appropriate opportunity opportunities to them so this is incorporated through article 39f so article f uh, article 39f has been 
rephrased and this particular aspect uh, has been incorporated. Next one is promotion of equal justice and provide free legal aid to poor people. So this is to ensure equal justice. Right. So Article 39A has been added to the DPSP. Next one is secure participation of workers in the management of industries. Article 39A has been incorporated. So this is to prevent the concentration of wealth. Concentration of wealth in few hands. So concentration of wealth in few hands. This has to be prevented. Next one is promotion of environment, forest and wildlife. So Article 48A has been added to the Directive Principles of State Policy. So next, uh, 44th Amendment Act uh, that was made in 1978 during the Janata government period. Right. So added Article 38 to, to dra uh, Directive Principles. So it direct the, uh, directed the state to Minimize inequalities in income, status, facilities, and opportunities. So, <coughs> this is also a kind of socialist principle, socialist ideal. So, as we can say, even now also, there are a lot of income inequalities, and day by day, these are rising. So, if you see the uh, indexes like Guinea quotient. And uh, recently there is a report of Oxfam. So it is saying that income and uh, wealth, uh, there are highly high income and wealth inequalities. And the worrying thing is those inequalities are riding, rising day by day. Here we are trying to reduce the inequalities. But contrary to, contrary to that, the income inequalities and wealth inequalities are rising. So still, there is a lot of work there uh, to uh, do here. So the government should focus on reducing the uh, income and wealth inequalities. Next one is 86th Constitutional Amendment Act of 2002. So basically, this is to uh, guarantee the primary or elementary education. Education to children between the age of 16 and 14 years. So, it modified Article 45 within the Directive Principles, mandated the state to provide early childhood care and education for all children up to the age of 14 years, asserted education as a fundamental right under Article 21A. So, these are the major changes that were brought to uh, 86th Amendment Act of 19, uh, 2002. Next one is 97th Amendment Act of 2011. So this is basically about cooperative societies. Right. So introduce Article 43B in Directive Principles of State Policy. It requests, it uh, uh, asks the state to promote uh, voluntary formation, autonomous functioning, democratic control, and the professional management of cooperative societies. So, in this way, this amendment has asked the government to strive hard for achieving the spirit of cooperation and developing rural India through the uh, spirit or principles of cooperation. Right. Now uh, we will see efforts to implement a DPSP. So as we have discussed uh, discussed earlier, so the dis uh, directive principles are non-justiciable. I mean, people cannot go to courts and ask that uh, the DPSP shall be implemented, can uh, have to be implemented. So uh, this option is not there. So the government itself should take step steps and try to implement the DPSP. So it has brought in several acts, several schemes, and it appointed several commissions to reali realize the principles that are mentioned in the Directive Principles of State Policy. We will see some of those actions or efforts. Right. The first one is, uh, as I have told, there are several acts, there are schemes, and there are commissions appointed by central and state governments 
to realize the principles that are mentioned in the directive principles. Right. First one is the planning commission has been uh, appointed. Later, it was replaced by Niti Aayog to formulate uh, plans for the development and growth of the country. Next one is land reforms. Very very important initiative. This has taken immediately after the independence. So the reforms that were taken are broadly abolition of zamindaris, that is abolition of middlemen and tenancy reforms. Uh, proper rights have to be ensured to the tenants those who take uh, take the lands on lease and work on them and the next one is ceilings and land holding holdings this is to ensure that the land uh, is given to the tillers i mean those who are actually practically working on the lands the ownership rights should be conferred on those people so basically there are three kinds of land reforms try to remember them so the land reform acts have been made to implement the dpsp Right. Also, measures to support the underprivileged privileged sections. So, such as measures such as free legal aid, a protection of contractual workers, minimum wages. There is a minimum wages act and abolition of child and bonded labor. There are acts also acts to this particular aspect and uh, resolution of industrial disputes. So, these are some of the measures taken by the government. Next, next one is specific measures for women's welfare. That is Equal Remuneration Act, ensuring equal wages to both men and women. Next one is Acts for Protection of Wildlife and the Conservation of Forest. So we have like Wildlife, uh, Wildlife Protection Act, Biodiversity Act, Envi uh, Environment Protection Act. So these kind of uh, acts have been brought to ensure this particular principles. Also, there are boards like Central Pollution Control Board, etc. So, all these measures have been taken to protect environment and wildlife. Next, to promote uh, village industry or to protect the li livelihoods of the people, Khadi and the Village Industries Board has been uh, constituted or incorporated. Handlooms and handicrafts boards also incorporate. So, basically these are to protect the Cottage industries. So basically, in India, cottage industries are there mostly in textiles sector. So to ensure to protect these uh, uh, sector or uh, the cottage industries uh, that are there in this sector, particular actions have been taken. Next, legislation for protection of ancient monuments. So one particular act has been brought to protect the uh, historic and important places. Next one is reservations in government jobs and political institutions for SCs, STs and OBCs. Recently, reservations also given for EBCs, econ economically backward classes and this has been accepted and approved by the Honorable Supreme Court also. Right. Next, laws addressing civil rights and preserving social exploitation. Sorry, preventing social exploitation. Ex exploitation. So there are civil rights act. Protection of civil rights acts is there. Right. Next, uh, there is an, also another act. Prevention of atrocities. Prevention of atrocities on SCSTs. So this particular uh, act is also there. So these are acts have been brought to ensure that, uh, this particular provision. Next, establishment of village panchayats along with reservations for weaker sections. This is to pro promote grassroots level democracy. Level democracy and also the provision of ensure the provision of organizing village panchayats. Similarly, there are various programs initiated by the government from time to time from uh, the community program CDP. So here on, there are several measures have been taken to address the issue of poverty and ensuring adequate income, adequate living income to people. So programs like CDP, Community Development Program, Hill Area Development Program, 
Integrated Rural Development Programs, IRDP, MG Narega. So this is also uh, provides, tries to provide adequate wages to people. It guarantees 100 days of work for the rural households, eligible rural households. And also some health, health schemes, National Rural, uh, rural Health Mission and a recent Ayushman Bharat. So these, uh, all these measures have been taken to ensure uh, adequate livelihood for the pe people and also to ensure the health of the people. So now we will see the criticism about DPSP, why the DPSP has been criticized. First one is non-justiciable nature. So if the principles or the guarantees that are mentioned in, mentioned in the DPSP are not fulfilled, fulfilled or not realized, the person cannot go to court and ask that whatever the principles or the guarantees that are there in the DPSP shall be implemented. So that option is not there. So on that lines, many constitu constituent assembly members themselves, they criticize, uh, criticize the DPSP that. So without guaranteeing them, there is no purpose of including or incorporating these DPSP in the constitution. So there was criticism in the constituent assembly debates itself. So even now, uh, some of the experts are even still criticizing DPSP because of this particular nature. Next one is, it raises the question about the practical effectiveness of DPSP because these are not guaranteed. Right. The second criticism is, these principles are in conflict with fundamental rights that are mentioned in the part 3. So, in the first half, after the um, till the 50 years after the independence, we can see a huge conflict between the fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy. The government tried to implement a DPSP. So then the people affected by these amendments went to court that their particular fundamentals have been, have been uh, violated by the DP, I mean the acts brought by the government to implement a DPSP. There was huge co conflict and uh, the conflict uh, was uh, settled in later, through later cases like Minerva Mills case, Keshwananda Bharati case, we will see those cases also. So, it is right, actually in the, in the beginning of the, beginning after, immediately after the independence, there was conflict between fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy. If one part, the government tried to implement one part, the other part is being, uh, in some way or the other, it is violated. So, this issue was there. Right. <coughs> Next one is resource constraints. So, basically, DPSP are a huge, they demand a huge resources to implement the ideals or the principles or the goals mentioned in the DPSP, basically the government requires huge financial resources. That kind of resources are not there uh, with the uh, with the government in, in the beginning uh, in the beginning stages. Even now we are struggling hard to implement the wel welfare schemes. There are not uh, sufficient funds are not available with the governments. So this was a major problem in the beginning immediately after the independence. So, this is also one of the reasons, major reasons that these rights, directive principles are made, DPSP are made non-justiciable because the governments of the day do not have the means to implement these uh, ideals or goals. So, this is also one reason that these uh, DPSP are made uh, non-justiciable. Next. Next, lack of clarity. Some of the DPSP lack clarity. So, they are not explained clearly or they are not uh, mentioned clearly. For example, uh, it led to challenge, challenging to formulate precise policy. So, this uh, lack of clarity created confusion in uh, bringing proper, pol proper policies. Even when the acts are made or policies are brought in, so because of the lack of clarity, they have been challenged in the, challenged in the courts of law. So, this lack of clarity also contributed to in, uh, ineffective implementation of, implementation of DPSP. Next, ineffectiveness in achieving social justice. 
so there are some measures uh, have been taken by the governments still uh, even after taking those kinds of measures still we are unable to achieve social justice social justice means equal opportunities to uh, all people equal opportunity so we can give n number of examples to substantiate this claim like still income inequalities are very high income inequalities are very high so opportunities are not equally given to all people now sections like sc st obcs still they struggle to grab the opportunities that are there right so if we see the indexes like poverty illiteracy still uh, people from particular sections they are unable to uh, overcome the poverty or get literate and get job so certain sections of the people are still str struggling so there is inequality in opportunity and uh, whatever resources available so inequality there in accessing the resources also so in a way uh, the dpsp are ineffective ineffective in achieving the social justice next is political expediency so certain governments governments of the time choosing particular dpsp so they are choosing only particular D, uh, dpsp certain dpsps and try to uh, gain political score political points on that best example is article 44 uniform civil code so some kind of politicization of dpsp has also taken place so on that lines also dpsp has been criticized so next is changing social dynamics so basically the dpsp have been formulated in mid 28th 20th century now it has been almost 75 years and there are several social and economic changes so the dpsp are kind of became became redundant to reflect these uh, new social and economic realities so in on that lines also DP, dpsp has been criticized right so now we will see the comparison of direct to principles of state policy and uh, fundamental rights so they these two parts are very very important in the constitution we can say these are the most important parts in the constitution we will see a comparison between the two so granville asked him opined that he is a constitutional expert so his opinions are very very important when uh, when it comes to indian constitution so please try to remember this name so both he opined that both directive principles of state policy and fundamental rights they reflect the conscience of the constitution so they are very very important to the constitution sharing common goals and protecting rights and promoting welfare of the people so he said that both are uh, conscience of the constitution next so both fundamental rights and directive principles uh, principles of state policy both have been recommended by rights subcommittees of the constituent assembly so both are very very important so the major fundamental difference is fundamental rights are uh, negative i mean they are constraints on the state so they are basically the restrictions on state state means here government uh, however the directive principles are uh, kind of compulsion duty of the government of the day to ensure those principles so basically the fundamental rights are negative in nature and the directive principles of state policy are positive in nature so they these are duties given to the state uh, uh, the other thing is the fundamental rights are negative in nature they are restricting the government they are restric restricting the state so the another difference is uh, fundamental rights are justiciable whenever they are violated people can go to court and ask for the uh, <coughs> uh, restoration of the rights however uh, directive principles are not just uh, <coughs> non justiciable and uh, courts cannot uh, order the government to i mean 
if they uh, people cannot go to court and ask the court that they should be implemented so this is the fundamental difference however despite being uh, non justiciable direct to principles are fundamental in the governance of the country governance of the country means uh, they act as the torch light in the hands of the government governments of the day whenever they try to bring policies acts or any other uh, schemes to ensure the to ensure the welfare of the people so they are fundamental in the governance of the country right another important difference is fundamental rights primarily focus on promoting the individual and the group welfare whereas the direct principles of state policy try uh, try to ensure the or promote the welfare of the community so basically uh, the direct principles focuses on on the entire society whereas the fundamental rights try to focus on the individual and group rights whereas dpsp focus on societal rights societal rights right right so most of the fundamental rights do not require legislative acts uh, whereas direct to principles of state policy require Uh, acts from the government to implement them this is one more important so some fundamental rights uh, even some fundamental uh, rights require uh, particular acts to implement them however most of the fundamental rights do not require a state act they themselves act as uh, the particular legislation however the directive principles of state policy require a act or law to implement them right next we will see uh, another important aspect that is conflict between fundamental rights of uh, fundamental rights and the directive principles of state policy as we have seen in the earlier days immediately after the constitution has been adopted there is conflict between fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy <coughs> so repeatedly it, uh, the measures have been uh, challenged in the courts of law and the court has delivered the judgments basically the government tried to implement the dpsp through various acts however certain people went to supreme court or judiciary uh, saying that our rights have been violated through the particular actions taken by the governments of the day best, uh, best example is land reforms the government tried to distribute the land to the poor, uh, poor people and landless people whereas the landlord landlords opposed this measure and said that their right to property has been violated so this is one example <coughs> right so when it comes to justiciability and enforceability the fundamental rights have the uh, option of justiciability and enforceability so in the beginning the fundamental rights have been prevailed over direct principles of state policy so in the case of champakan durai rajan this uh, this has been proven so the fundamental rights the honorable supreme court has supported fundamental rights and said that fundamental rights prevail over the directive principles of state policy uh, it has been repeated and right reiterated in the golaknath case and the case one on the bharti case also some ex- experts opine that there is a balance has been achieved in the case one on the bharti case itself and uh, it has been said that both are complementing each other they are not conflict uh, conflicting they are not conflicting rights and both each one uh, the fundamental rights and the dpsp complement each other but however some experts opine that the actual balance between both uh, both of them has been achieved in the minerva mills case of 1980 so here the honorable court has opined that uh, both uh, directive principles of state policy and uh, fundamental rights are essential there are they are essential for the well being of the people of the country so this is the opinion that has been given by honorable supreme court so in this way a compromise a compromise has been achieved uh, between fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy so ensure that if there are two options go with this option minerva mills case if that is not there i mean only one option is there if the question is about 
uh, achieving the balance between fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy. If Keshwananda Bharati is there and uh, Minerva Mills is not there, go with the option of Keshwananda Bharati. So, if both are there, go with the option of Minerva Mills case. So, basically, the court opened that the harmony and the balance between the two are deemed essential for uh, basic structure. I mean, uh, I mean, for promoting the welfare and uh, the goodness of the people, the proper balance between fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy is important. This is basically the opinion of uh, the Honorable Supreme Court. So, in this way, a settlement has been brought in between the fundamental rights of uh, fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy. Right. So, this is some information about the directive principles of state policy. I hope you have uh, gained some knowledge and uh, valuable information through, the, through this lecture. And now, we will see some uh, previously asked uh, questions in the prelims examination. First question is, it is asked in 2021. Uh, the question is, under the Indian constitution, concentration of wealth violates which particular part? So, the right to equality, directive principles of state policy, the right to freedom, the right to concept of concept of welfare. So, we have studied already. So, the concentration of wealth, um, it violates the directive principles of state policy because there is a particular provision that which, uh, which says that the state should ensure that there is no concentration of wealth in few hands. Right. So, option B becomes the correct option. Next one is question asked in 2020. Uh, which part of the constitution of India declares the ideal of welfare state? So, this is also relatively an easy question. Option A is directive principles of state policy. B, fundamental rights. C, preamble. D, 7, schedule. So, correct answer is directive principles of state policy. Very easy and straight question. Right. Next one is also asked in 2020. In India, separation of judiciary from executive is enjoined by so option A, preamble of the constitution. Option B, directive principles of state policy. Seventh schedule. Uh, conventional, the, it is a conventional practice. So, this is also straight and easy question. Correct answer is directive principles of state policy. So, we have seen article 50, which directly states, uh, directly states the, the state should ensure that judiciary is separated from the <coughs> executive to ensure uh, proper justice to the people. Right. So, option B is correct. So, next question with reference to Constitution of India, the directive principles of state policy constitute uh, constitute limits upon legislative function, executive function. So, options are only one, only two, both one and two, neither one and two. So, as we have seen already, uh, it will neither uh, put a control on legislative action nor on executive action. So, the option is correct option. Correct option is neither one, neither nor two. So, both one and two are incorrect. So, this is all for today, friends. Thank you. Thank you for joining the lecture. See you next time. Bye.